Welcome back to A Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and this afternoon I'm delighted to be joined by Lloyd Patrick Jepson and hopefully we'll also hear from Peter Magaki um, who's just getting set up as we speak. How you been Lloyd? It's been a few weeks since you were on the show. Yeah it has been. Managed to have a little break and everything so f- feeling good, refreshed. Let's get this over and done now and get the season rocking and rolling. Yes, absolutely. It has been a few weeks, but so much can happen in that time when it comes to the World of Celtic. Peter McGacky, how are you? Fantastic. Had a wee technical issue there, but we're, we're all good to go. We're rocking, absolutely. Yes, thanks everybody for getting involved. Let us know your comments in relation to what's happening with Celtic. Um, obviously, we were, we've been talking a lot about transfers. We're going to be talking a wee bit more about that today because a new name has entered the fray. And this is the thing, Lloyd, right? Every single transfer window, Celtic are linked with a plethora of names from all over the globe. And as a fan, you know, it's bread and butter. You love, the, you do love it to a degree. But when you're trying to discuss it, you think to yourself, you pick and choose which ones you want to do deep dives into because sometimes the source material isn't great. You're not quite sure if it's a name that's just been plucked out of an old scout report or if it's a name like Scott McTominay that isn't, isn't going to happen. Um, but there seems to be some uh, legs in our latest recruit, potential recruit, um, Mike Noroki. Have I said that right? Let's hope I have. Lloyd, what, what's your take on this? We, we do need to strengthen in that area of the park. And I think we were saying that prior to the, the game there against Yokohama. Yeah, I think we've been saying that even since the end of last season as well, that we kind of need to strengthen a little bit in that area. So it's kind of one of these things that you do look as if, there is arms and legs in this Naroki transfer, if that is the correct pronunciation of his name. I hope it is. So let's hope he's going to come in and be a good... I, I don't know if he'll go straight in at first team, but he'd be a good backup at least, if anything. But I think he's six foot three as well, so it kind of also ties into what Brendan said in his first press conference, that bit of physicality as well. You know, these, these are the things where... Um, you're interested in a player and you look at where they're coming from, the league that they're playing in, um, their physicality, all their stats and data that's available. Uh, but you also sometimes look at the the, uh, the actual transfer fee, Peter. Uh, are we wrong to look at a transfer fee and, and judge the player based on that? Because we've done so well in terms of purchasing people at that and within that kind of, um, you know, that sphere that have turned out to be absolute superstars for us. Uh, I, I'm sort of don't judge the transfer fee anymore. Um, we've had plenty of big, big names or big signings for five million that have, uh, haven't worked out, and we've had plenty of um, names maybe like for one to two million that have been uh, proved to be superstars. And then uh, look at people like Hatati and stuff. What what would they go for? Um, really big money in my in my view. So um, I really don't know and. Celtic can change players. It can make people rise to the occasion, or they can flop. So you can't really like um, take much into consideration when it comes to the fee. What I would be hoping for is to start landing these maybe more high quality signings. I think we absolutely need one, if not two, um, quality centre backs to come in, because looking at um, people like Welsh potentially leaving. Um, Kobayashi, no 100% on him. Uh, Starfelt, another sort of error. I get, I get it was a, in a friendly, but another error. He, he was the um, centre back that we were all um, looking for the last couple of years that we were sort of like, maybe we need to improve on him. So at this point, we're still going, oh, Starfelt's the sort of answer. Well, no, I think I think we need to improve. I think we need to um, uh, flex our muscles uh, in this transfer window. Like we We've got a great opportunity to do. Bring one, maybe two quality centre backs to play with Carter Vickers uh, to give you give you options. Potentially get people out the door. Potentially put people on loan that need to be loaned. Um, so we don't know. I mean, obviously you, you you jump on the YouTube clips and you see what it looks like. Anybody can look good. It just depends what they look like when they get a Celtic top on. So I'm open to it. I hope we get people in because we start need, we need to start getting bodies in. But um, I, it's sort of time will tell with any sign. We just need to wait and see. You know, there's been a lot of um, centre-halves in the not-too-distant past who showed promise, showed quite a lot of promise. Um, 
But then, for one reason or another, their Celtic careers didn't really um, flourish, you know. Uh, and I'm thinking of guys who were in and around the team in Brendan's first tenure uh, during his first spell, Lloyd. And I'm, I'm thinking of Simunovic and uh, Benkovic. Benkovic we spoke about uh, yesterday or the day before, whereby he, when he came in, he had been a massive signing for Leicester. Um you know, a, a fellow Croat, him and Simunovic were pals uh, in terms of what they did off the park in Glasgow. And I looked at those two and thought they had bags and bags of potential. And then you look at how their careers have actually developed since leaving Celtic, you know, virtually gone into um, semi-retirement, the two of them. Um, but they're, they're the type of player. This is what I was saying. I didn't want to re-sign them. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going down the Fraser Foster, Paddy Roberts route here. I didn't want to re-sign them. That was the type of player the, that type of physicality that I felt, um, I'm, I'm not going to put Starfield into this category, but I think when uh, Carter Vickers is injured, whoever comes in doesn't have that same stature. They don't have that physicality. We seem to have been bullied, not just at Ibrox, but we're bullied by Curtis Main against St Mirren at home. So when we go out there into the transfer market and we bring in a centre-half, I wanted them to be within that mould, Lloyd. And, and when I look at this, this potential new signing. I think he kind of fits that bill. Yeah, it kind of it does look as if it does kind of fit that bill, but going back to like obviously Yozo and Philip Benkovic as well I think the issue with they two back then it was injuries kind of plagued them a little bit so their careers never really took off at Celtic, which was a shame really because the two of them did have that potential back then, but if Narossi comes in and whether he takes Starfelt's place or else he's there to fill the gap at CCV's currently vacated at the minute whilst he's injured, then he could end up really becoming a really good player for us if he does fit that exact mould of the player that we need. Yeah. I was, I was a massive fan, actually, of both of the players that were mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you're right. It was, you know, ultimately injuries that put pay to their careers. We do have Kevin McCluskey waiting in the wings, by the way, and we're going to be asking Kevin um, not only for his pronunciation of a new player, <laughs> Uh, but also his thoughts on all things Celtic as well. But before I bring in, I'm just going to say I spent all morning working on the graphic here, lads, and now I'm going to have to change it. Um, but the reason I brought it up is because we will be uh, hearing more about the Football Content Awards very, very soon. They're going to be at Anfield this year. So we've been to Manchester, Liverpool um, is next up on the calendar and we'll let you know how you can help Axon to be there. And here we have him wearing his state of mind Dukla Prague-esque shirt. Kevin McCluskey, how are you? I'm very well, thanks Paul. Hi. I was waiting for you to do some sort of segue in there where you're talking about this physically imposing player that's going to come on and then it's me who's probably <laughs> the least physically imposing out of all the Axon contributors. Well, you know, you, you are very much balanced. You don't go in with the studs up and all that very often, uh, Kevin. So, yes, I wouldn't introduce you um, in such a way. I wouldn't dare do that. Now, with regards to what we're talking about, you know, during the pre-season, during any transfer window, Kevin, there's going to be so many players linked to Celtic. And I have a bit of fun with this sometimes when I look back through the old archives and I look at players that we were in for, we nearly signed, the one that got away, thank God we didn't sign that one. Um, and we've been speaking about people like uh, Viali and Rivaldo and all that. Um, well, this might not be as sexy a name in world football, but it could be just what we need at this moment in time, Kevin. Your man, I'm going to try and... Right, I was trying to look up his name to see if I could get the correct pronunciation, but Wikipedia was no help. So we're just going to go with Navrocki, I think, might be it. I don't know. But yeah, um, I think from what I've seen of him, he looks a really good player. I think uh, can I, Lloyd was hitting the nail on the head with the description of him. He looks physically imposing. He's quick. He covers the ground well. He seems to have pretty decent stats and his kind of ability to win the ball in the air, which is going to be useful in Scottish football. And it's where the likes of Kobayashi's fallen down for us. So, I mean, he's a very new name to everyone here. So he might turn out to be one that gets away if we don't get him. Um, I'm hopeful that I'm hopeful that he lives up to the, the promise that you've seen in the YouTube videos and the promise that you see in the stats. And if you look at the league he's in as well, Probably the Electra Classa in Poland be a similar standard to Scotland. So we know he can cut it at this level. He's got European experience. So if the interest is genuine, 
and he's as good as we like to think he is, then yeah, let's hope we go out and get him. And he's not one of those ones that gets away and he doesn't become a Benkovic like you mentioned before. Who was the other one? Remember we were in for a player who ended up going to the, um, was it the South African Ajax team? Remember him, big centre half. And it all came down to his medical. Uh, he was almost over the line. Someone in the comments will be able to remember his name. I think it was. That's Coatsa. right. Yeah, Aye. yeah. So right. there's so many players where you kind of and skim then, the post. And then we went and signed Marvin Comper instead. Right. Moving on <laughs> um, from Comper. But still sticking with the transfers, Kev, I'll ask you the question as well. I asked Peter, in relation to transfer fees, sometimes people just gauge the player by the fee. Um, and I think you can be led down the garden path with that one because you look at some of the big fees we've paid in recent times and the player hasn't worked out. And then you look at the kind of lesser fees and those guys have really come to the fore for Celtic. You then look at somebody like Maurice Jens, for example, who, and, and you know the, the fee that he commanded recently. Was it something in the region of 10 million quid? In my view, he's nowhere near that type of player. He should never be anywhere near that bracket. Loads of different circumstances um, will then result in a big fee from time to time. Does it ever concern you? Or are you at the stage where you just think, you know what, this could be another one for the recruitment team to pull out the bag? Yeah, I'm with Peter on this one. I don't think the size of the transfer fee really concerns me that much. Um, I don't know if it's kind of like the generation that we live in and we've all kind of grown up playing games like Football Manager and whatnot. And you want to go out and splash the cash and make the big signings every summer and makes you feel good because it's not your money that you're spending, it's on a computer game. But in reality... Uh, it doesn't really bother me how much you spend on a player. Like Again, Peter said it, we've spent £5 million on duds, and then we've went out and spent half a million or a million, and the players turned into being a superstar for us. So the value doesn't really concern me. It's about what he can do in the park. And if you look at somebody like a Jens, he's gone for, what was it, 8 to £10 million pounds because he's from, from Germany and playing in Germany. It's a Bundesliga transfer fee. Mm-hmm. Jens in Scotland is a £2 or £3 million pound player. And that's the difference. So it's you've got to gauge everything like his age, where have you signed him from, what's his competitive history in the game and whatnot. But yeah, and overall, size of the transfer fee, it's not a big concern what you can do in the park. What sometimes, again, you, you do try and do, Lloyd, is you try and figure out, is this a player that, you know, Brennan Rogers fancied, or is it a player that the recruitment team identified? And I spoke about that, and it's, I think it's less of an issue now than it used to be at Celtic. But that used to be a big issue. There's been the, the mention of Compare, for example. There's loads of others. I don't want to labour that fact. Um, but you, we were talking the other day there about how we're watching Celtic for the first time in a while, but it still looks like Angie Celtic, even though they're wearing the new hoops, which I'm pretty sure you bought, Lloyd. I'm pretty sure you've uh, gone back on any criticism that I've made. Um, But it still looks like Angie Celtic. And even when you bring in a couple of guys who we've not yet seen uh, in the hoops, um, and they're they're recruited by our recruitment team, and they're often called legacy sign-ins. You know, they're people who have been part of the scouting network for a while now. It still looks like a Kenny Ange, Postacoglu team. You're sometimes looking as a fan, I guess, for someone that you can actually, you know, pin your colours on and say, that's a Brennan Rodgers signing. Um, again, is that something that will concern you if you come through this transfer window and it doesn't look as though we've brought in any bodies that have been highlighted and pinpointed by Brendan? Even uh, though we not... know he's having the final say yeah. in, in the transfers. At the moment, I don't think so, no. It's it's more about Brendan's assessing the squad at the moment, seeing what best... Obviously, it does still look like an Ange Postacoglu team. So far, we've only signed Thiago home and uh, Tilio as well, as long as Yang and Quan ready to come in the next few days as well. So it's only tactical tweets that you're really seeing at the minute. So I'm not really too concerned about who we bring in at the moment because it's just, it'd be different in two weeks' time when the league's officially kicking off. Then you're kind of hoping, right, transfers are starting to ramp up and it has more Brendan Rodgers signings you're starting to see there. But at the same time, these guys that are coming in and now probably have been scouted by the recruitment team well in advance and these are the ones that we're bringing in at the moment and getting them over the line you know what i'm, I'm really reluctant peter I'm, I'm very reluctant to write any of these players off because um maybe in the past you'd have, you'd have put them in the bracket a project player for example um but then you look back to that sensational january transfer window where we bring in maeda matt o'reilly and rio hatati 
for what was the combined cost? Five million quid for the three players, something spectacular like that. Um, and you think to yourself, I'm never going to write another player off based on the transfer fee because there are still nuggets out there if you look hard enough in the right markets. I definitely. Um, we we know the sort of uh, the the road that Celtic are going down. We're always going to sort of try and be this. Uh, player trading model we're going to try and get players in for cheap and sell them for a higher fee um on like uh the sort of friendlies and stuff that the way it's been going i i don't know maybe i'm a, I'm a wee bit concerned it's like when you talk about it still being angie's team i'm worried when we first got rogers um the first time around he had this obviously gravitas we could we were lucky to have rogers and this time around, it almost feels like Rogers is sort of just happy to be back at Celtic, and like because he's got get a second chance, and and I want him to come in with that um, all guns blazing approach the way he had the first time and be demanding on the players. But I'm just like, it's almost like he's sort of settling for uh, what Celtic are giving him at this point, and I and I think this is the time we need a we need the manager to be strong, and we need him to we need him to say. This is these are the players I want, and I want to make some you know big signings that are really going to take this uh, take this team forward in Europe. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, we see that going forward. It's just you're a wee bit concerned at this stage because um, we don't know the players that are coming in. We really don't we don't know how they play. We've seen YouTube clips. We're not familiar with anybody, and there's literally about two a couple of weeks to the start of the season. And by this point, I think you want to see a real shape to the team and a real like um like a real style of play, maybe a new style of play or something, or is it going to go to the same sort of way that Ange goes? Um I don't know, for me it's sort of like you're just sort of waiting, waiting to see what's going to happen. And and I think we've been in such a strong position and we've been like this in the past and we've sort of let opportunities pass us by. And I feel that that's why I'm getting a wee bit wee bit Reckless because I'm saying we're in such a strong position. We're going into Europe. We need we need to have a European quality quality team, and we don't know if we're going to have that because we just don't know what these players are going to be like. They might be world beaters or they might be they might be flops and people that we just don't see on a regular basis. So I um I actually forgot your your point there, but I um. <laughs> uh, I you need to wait and see with these players again. We just don't know what's going to happen, and I just feel as if we're sort of all in the dark. We just don't know what they're going to look like. That that is more the case, I think, Peter, because it's not about writing players off. It's just about the knowledge that you might have of the kind of lower profile players that Celtic have been introducing. And as I say, you know, it, it was also. Some people see it as a criticism that we have a link to the City Group and we have access to a network of, let's say, agents and managers, coaches, players. And I don't see that as a negative. I just see it as, um, you know, you tapping into a database almost of of talent. And let's be honest, it's fared us pretty well uh, over the piece. I know that Kevin, we'll we'll talk about the game uh, the other day and also the game coming up tomorrow, uh, some of the, the positives and negatives of that. Kevin, you've been looking at the goalkeeper situation, so let's have a wee chat about where we are in terms of the goalies. Um, I remember when Brendan came in first time round, and I agree with Peter, actually. I do get the sense that it was um, a completely different kind of style that Brendan, you know, obviously there was the the massive fanfare when he came in, live streaming it, 13,000 at the stadium, uh, Brendan looking very tanned um, at that time and all that. But now it was been a lot more low-key, um, but is that due to the fact that, you know what, Kevin, the, the transformation um, that Celtic required first time round, I don't think we need that this time round. It's more tweaking and tinkering with that side to to, main, to ensure that we can maintain a domestic dominance, but also uh, improve in Europe. Yeah, do you know, I've been thinking about this for the last few while, actually, and I couldn't quite get it into my head what I was thinking. Right. And then I think, again, Peter's just nailed it. It's... When Brendan Rodgers came the first time around, there was a huge fanfare because he just left Liverpool and he was one of the hottest kind of prospects, managerial prospects going, and we managed to get him. And that was a major coup for us. And then this time, there is a bit of a feeling like he's more happy to be back at Celtic than Celtic are to have him, in a sense. And there's not the same kind of momentum or emphasis behind him coming back. Now, maybe that's just 
just how we see it in a way. I don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it seems it seems a lot more low key, and I think it had to be in a sense because of the way that he left us the last time. He couldn't come back as some kind of returning hero with the big prodigal son, kind of welcome back Brendan with the party poppers coming out and whatnot. That could never happen. He's had to come back. He's had to take it a bit more kind of reserved and low key. But now we're getting into business end of pre-season. I think you do want to see things getting ramped up a wee bit and having a wee bit more uh, enthusiasm coming out of the place and just get you really pumped up again for the start of the new season because it is just a few weeks away. And we want to all be really positive and just talking about positive things going into that first game against Ross County. And at, at the moment, there is still a wee bit of negativity going around somewhere, which isn't great. No, there is. There is. And, you know, the, the thing is, as well, as a club, I think we played it down a, a fair bit. But you made a point there about uh, Brennan Rogers' first time round being the best we could possibly get. I think there's an argument to say that he was the best second time round as well. But due to the circumstances of his departure, you're right. It was almost as if, right, you can't do like a WWF um, entrance here, at Brendan. You're going to have to like play it down a wee bit. Um, the other the other name, uh, Xavier Muyamba, um, has also been linked to Celtic. We spoke about him yesterday, 21 years of age. He was a player that's been name-checked by Stephen McGowan. He's another centre-half Dutch, playing for Volendam, can also play right back, and he came through Barcelona and Chelsea's youth systems. 41 games of senior football uh, over the Netherlands. It's clear that the centre-half position is a priority. But let's link that in before we get to the goalies to the performance the other day. Uh, we've gone into that game, Lloyd, where we knew Carter Vickers would be out. We've known that for a long time, a number of weeks. Um, Starfelt, before the game, I'm speaking about Starfelt as being the leader. He's going to have to be the rock here because he's playing in a defence where him, Hart and Taylor are the experienced ones, not just in terms of their careers, but also within that Celtic defence, playing together, played a lot of games together. And then you're introducing Kobayashi, who had had a few games at the end of last season and didn't really do too well. And then Awata, who is playing in an unfamiliar role at right back. And in actual fact, I thought he'd done pretty well. But at that time, I think it says a lot. First thing I would say is it shows Stephen Welsh where he is in the pecking order, uh, which is pretty far down the pecking order. Kobayashi, I think uh, Brennan Rogers was right to put him in. You know, in the surroundings as well, no better place for Kobayashi to get a couple of games under his belt. Uh, obviously, he got injured, which was very unfortunate. And then Awata, I thought to myself, well, we're down to the bare bones here. We could play Welsh there. Welsh has played it right back. Uh, but Awata had played quite a few games there as well. And I thought he did okay, I'm going to be honest. But I also don't think that Kobayashi had a particularly bad game, Lloyd. But I've seen a lot of kind of reactions saying the usual kind of performance from Kobayashi, not convinced, get rid. Kobayashi was that centre-half that we thought we needed. Um, we've maybe seen him in half a dozen games. He's had a couple of poor games. I don't think the other day was a was a poor game by him. No, he looked a bit more comfortable. Maybe it was just the surroundings as well. On Wednesday where he was, obviously being back home and things. But I can't believe I'm going to criticise Carl Starfelt, but to me he had... When he's poorer games, even though it was just a pre-season friendly, but that pass back, I don't know what he's doing at all. But I don't like criticising him, considering I've stuck a bet on him for the past two years. It's scored the first goal every time, so that's how much I love Carl Starfelt. But yeah, the, the defence was a bit makeshift. We obviously a water at right back, but he came through not too bad. Taylor, Taylor had an okay game, and then obviously... We go into the goalkeeper situation of Joe Hart as well, which he just fumbled the ball completely at the striker's feet. It, it was, uh, you know, he went doing an instalments, didn't he? Um, I'm probably going to pull up the uh, defence that started Brendan Rodgers' first competitive game against Lincoln Red Imps. I'm going to bring that up and have a look at that. Um, and then compare it to what could be our first competitive um, lineup this time round. We're in a much better position, Peter. Let's not forget, we've just won the treble. Yeah, we've lost Jota. We've lost Jota. Um, but he's a player that, you know, I'm going to go back to the conversation we had last pre-season, right? Where we had Carter Vickers and Jota, um, who had played a year on loan. And we obviously had um, an option on both players. And, you know, I think every contributor on Axon was asked the question, it's very unlikely we're going to get the two on which one would you prefer? And uh, the vast majority did say Carter Vickers. 
So I'm going to try and turn this around and say, well, it's not like we've lost Carter Vickers, is it? I mean, Jota, Jota's a massive loss. Um, we couldn't replace him. This is what I'm trying to say. We can't replace Jota like for like because we're not going to sign a player who's going to cost that kind of money. You've got to, to a degree, sign potential and hope that you can develop it. And I think that's what we are doing. We are, we are signing wingers who might not be at the level of Jota. But when we, when we signed Jota, he wasn't the superstar that he became. So I think we've got to give these new signings time to bed into the side as well, Peter. No, definitely. We need, uh, we need to give them time. I'm not writing anybody off whatsoever. It's just when you've not seen someone, you have to sort of... You have to wait and see how they cope with the demands again. Big players have came and, and failed at Celtic, so and lesser players have came and flourished. So you just need to wait and see how they go. Um, I like we can't replace a, a type of like a Jota type player, but we can certainly buy someone on the level that he was. You know, a similar type type of uh, player that had been maybe uh, struggling to find a, a club full time and uh, really get his uh, football going. So. We can look for players like that again, maybe sign them for five, six million and reignite their career. We've proven that we can move people on to the, the English uh, English league and abroad if they want to go to like Saudi Arabia and stuff. So they know every player knows that coming here you, you, you get you get European football guaranteed, Champions League, huge nights at Celtic Park and a fan base that is going to adore you if you, if you play well. Um, so there's a huge carrot for a lot of players, um, and yeah, I, exactly. I think it is weird. Uh, we feel a wee bit sort of sort of downbeaten with watching some of the games and sort of waiting for the season to start because then you're waiting for uh, players to come in and stuff. But uh, we have just won the treble, and I think the way the sort of like feeling from both sets of fans from the Rangers side and Celtic side, I think you think. The uh, Rangers have won the league already. Um, I I think they've got the treble in the bag. It seems like because um, they've got about they've signed about six uh, nine foot plumbers to throw lump balls in, bill ball into the air. And uh, but listen, that that's that's going to be a challenge coming forward. You're going to you're going to um, have to prove that you're going to be strong at um, strong in defence, uh, strong at set pieces. That's just a fact of the matter. They have got taller. Physical players, so we need to counter that. We need to have really good footballers, but we also need to get a bit of physicality into the team. I think. Um, I think when you look around the team, people like uh, Kobayashi certainly wouldn't rule him out. But I think if you got a, a one to two centre backs in, I think he would be the fourth choice for me. Like I'm happy to have him in the squad. I think he could do. Uh, he could come on in games and and. Um, and be fine. He could play in sort of cup games, but would I trust him in the big, big games at this moment? I don't think so. Looking at um, the other sides of the defence, um, I don't want to go in on everybody. Greg Taylor looks as if he's sort of struggling to get fitness again, so he looked quite tired the other night for me. Um, the one thing I noticed about Burnaby is the energy he gave when he came on. He was, he was straight away, he was down the line, but that is like... 50% for, Ber for Burnaby. I've never seen him have more than a 50% game for me. It's like he can do some stuff going forward, but he's caught out so much, so much uh, in defence. It's scary. Mm -hmm. um, and he's so small. So for me, I think we need to look at a, maybe a strong... Like Rogers likes these sort of maybe sort of taller, more athletic fullbacks. Johnston for me is that guy. Carter Vickers plays with a new centre-back beside them and for me a new left-back, strong left-back And of course the other part of that uh, the back line is the goalie, we're going to talk about that as well, I know Kevin's been working on various blogs etc, I'm also going to ask you guys about, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the 10 players I would actually cut from Celtic squad um, and it's interesting because other people are coming in and being even more brutal than me, I thought I was being pretty brutal uh, but other people are coming in and throwing in Burnaby and throwing in names like Ralston, um, who I didn't even really consider as being a, you know that type of player who was on the periphery of the squad. Um, I'd much rather trim it that way before looking at guys who are actually in and around the squad who have played a lot of games um, over the piece for Celtic. Now, I'm really keen to get your thoughts on all things Celtic Double Denim. Afternoon to you and a hail hail also to Jim Conlon. It's great to see the names coming up. Joe, you're not the only 
a Celtic fan from Sunny Danoon who tunes into Axom as well. Um, where are you watching the show? It's always great to hear from you from all over the world. Edmund Byrne, hail, hail from Guinea. How good is that? Is it Guinea? Sorry, Guinea. Um, should be back in Bonnie, Scotland next month. I'm struggling on the pronunciations today. I'm even struggling to say it, Lloyd. Uh, but thanks for your support, mate. Daniel F, um, two years ago, we announced Big Beautiful Carol. I just brought this up so that I could call Carol Starfield Big Beautiful Carol. Um, and obviously, I can't say his name properly. We'd love to get a bigger, stronger defender in as much as I love him. Well, defence looks terrible when CCV is gone. It does. It does. It looks so different when you, you remove the keystone from that defence. Um, I was going on about Starfield coming in, being the leader, making sure that you know he can uh, bring that that um, unlikely kind of partnership together, and it didn't really happen. And he's the guy that that you know he was clearly to blame for one goal. He was partly to blame for another uh, on the night, and he's a guy as well who you know people do you know criticise him a hell of a lot. And I think he's on a short lease. If he makes one mistake, you're on him. You know, if Ka if Rio Atati misplaces a pass, which he does several times a game, nobody bats an eyelid because it's Rio Atati. But if Carol Starfield does it, albeit in a different area of the park, it's an issue. I want to talk about goalkeepers, Kevin McCluskey. I'll come to you first. Um, and, you know, it's fitting, having just had Danielle up on the screen, that I'm going to talk about goalkeepers, where we are with the goalies. Uh, not so long ago, we were talking about the fact that we had, how many goalies did we have? Six goalies? Six, I think. Six mm -hmm. goalkeepers, including Toby Oweliemi. We now have uh, Scott Bain, uh, Benji Segrist and Joe Hart. Uh, and that's the kind of order, um, you know, that they're in as well. We've um, managed to offload Connor Hazard to Plymouth Argyle and uh, Vasilis Barkas. Uh, we tore up his contract. and It was a very expensive um, experience having him at the club. Kevin, where are we with the goalies? Because I still think that if you've got three first-team goalies in Bain, Segrist and Hart, you're probably, you know, you're at the, the, the magic figure for me. And then you've got the backup of the young player in Toby. Um, do we move Segrist or Bain on, or both? Do you bring in another goalie and, and sign him as a number one? Um, and then hopefully him and Hart can, you know, have a, a battle for the gloves during the season. How do you play it this season? Yes. Um, right, I'll start off with the numbers. I think three is probably the perfect number to have for goalies, but I would do it slightly different uh, to how you've kind of outlined it. Um, I would get rid of Bain and I would get rid of Segris because I don't think either of them have got any sort of future in the club. It's the, the, the one that you ask all the time about any of the backups. If you had to play them against Rangers at Ibrox or in a Champions League game, would you trust them? And you just wouldn't. No, right. you would not. Bain's had chances over the last four or five seasons that he's been with us and he's never once been able to cement himself as the number one keeper, even when he's had the chance, uh, because he, did, he even had the chance before Joe Hart came in because he got the second game over in Mitchell and was dreadful. So I think he's had too many chances. He might be good around the dressing room and all that, but... <laughs> that, old the fact you, that old chestnut. That old chestnut. Apparently for a keeper, you've got to be good between the sticks as well and he's not. So he's not the answer. Segrist was a very good keeper for Dundee United, but he's not cut it at Celtic. And I think that's partly because you need to be a different type of keeper to play for Celtic and Dundee United. He's he's more involved at United, um, and I think his concentration's not good enough for us. He switches off, and then I know it was just a pre-season game, but every goal he lost the other day, he didn't make a move for them. And that's the Enough. minimum you expect. Just, just make, make an effort, dive. You know, you might get something on it. So now I think I would get rid of both of them. While with Segrist, I will also say, I know there's some sort of personal issues that's going on behind the scenes there, and he's that's affecting him. He's a human being, and you've just got to accept that as well. And if he wants to move to Australia, he'd be closer to his partner. You know, be human and let it happen. So I'd get rid of them. So that leaves us only with Joe Hart. Um... And for me, I would then be looking to promote Toby to be the third choice keeper or move him out on loan because I think your third choice is is one that we're really going to use through a season so he can be someone that's young and youthful. But then I would go out and I would sign as a keeper that's good enough right now to challenge Joe Hart for the number one jersey. Mm -hmm. And that's not saying that Hart's not good enough to keep it for this season because I think he is. But long term, there's got to be a progression in place of a succession plan. And if we can get someone in now that's good enough to be the number one, 
when Hart's contract's up at the end of the season, we can let him go after three good years and we've got someone that we can trust who's had a year to bed into the club, had a year to learn under Joe Hart, a year to experience the big games without necessarily being involved in them, and then is ready to become the number one. And I, I'll do a bit of self-promotion. If you want to go and have a look at the Axon blog, you can check out the three keepers that I've kind of suggested for us, all of whom I think are ready to come in to be first choice at Celtic because they've been first choice somewhere else and could be our keeper for the next three or four seasons and be the next player that we can then sell on for a big fee because that's the model that we've got to get into and um, got to make the most of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is because <clears throat> in terms of that, the model, if you look at the goalkeepers we've had in the kind of near... Um, the near past, Lloyd. Right? If you if you look at Joe Hart, for example, there's going to be no sell on for Joe Hart. It was a completely different type of signing when we brought him in. We needed that kind of safety. Let's not forget, we needed that safety net of Joe Hart. We needed the leadership, the experience, the whole thing, and it's worked. You know, yes, he said his mistakes. Which goalie doesn't have his mistakes? If you go behind, uh, you go backwards rather from Joe Hart. You've got Barkas. There was no sell on, and that that was that was a really expensive mistake. Um, you go further back on that and you've got Craig Gordon and, and Forster where Forster was on loan. Craig Gordon moved on to Hearts out of contract. It, it's part of the strategy that we haven't been able to get a goalkeeper in who fits that model, have we, Lloyd? I mean, you know, at that kind of age, the 21 to 24, where you bring them in for a decent amount and, um, you know, they play three or four years, as Kevin says, and you sell them on. Obviously, a very, very difficult player to find. Yeah, it's a it's a tricky position to find as well. I think is because the way the modern game's going, you're you're asking a bit more of your goalkeeper than what you used to, where it was just about saving the shots. But I completely agree with what Kevin said as well. I would literally get ready being in secrets because they're just not good enough, and I would start thinking about maybe benching Joe Hart as well and bringing that one to fight for that number one spot. Because but you need to look at it as well is Europe for the goalkeeper and the goalkeeper can just be important in Europe because we've not had a goalkeeper like Foster in a good number of years who did win his, and got us out of the Europa League group stage at some points and also won his valuable points in Champions League so that's what you need to start looking at when you're looking for that position mm -hmm. He he was a revelation but I tell you he mm -hmm. took his time at Celtic you know he really did to become that goalkeeper I remember um, there, there was an announcement that we had I think we'd either got him back in on loan or we'd made the deal permanent and we were playing um, Sion. Remember we played that game, they knocked us out of Europe, but there was a mess, uh, a mistake. I think that's when we come on loan again. That, that was his second loan, I think, right? Mm -hmm. So he comes in and it was all, you know, even at that point, it was a bit underwhelming. Oh, right, OK, we've brought him back in on loan. He developed at Celtic to the point where he became indispensable almost and he was going and he was winning us games. You know, he, he was. He'd done as much against Barcelona as anybody else, as as Wanyama or Tony Watt to win that game. He'd done as much against Lazio as anyone else to win those games. So we've not had that goalie for a while. I absolutely agree with that. Um, yeah. In relation to a Young... Good, a good goalkeeper's worth about 10 points a season mm -hmm. to you, mm -hmm. in that respect. And, we, and that's... Like what Lloyd's saying, it's a very difficult thing to find. And there's not really a metric out there for people that want to look at the stats and all that. There's no metric out there that says how many points this keeper has won you in a season. There's no point, uh, there's no metric that says how many points Joe Hart won us last season. But I'll bet he won us more than we think because of when he's made his saves. But aye, that's, that's the keeper that we need. That one that you just think he'll go and he'll win us 10 points a season. And we knew we were getting that with Forster. When we when we signed them permanently that time, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's a very very difficult thing to identify and get in. Yeah, and some people would have them back as well. But you know, it's one of the things getting the old gang back together. It's not always the way to go. And I think you know Toby Uwaliemi as well, Peter. He's a guy. He's actually sat on the bench um, for Celtic in Europe against Bodo Glimt. Um, he went out on loan last season, didn't have a best time of it because after two games he was injured. So people are focusing on just two games of football that he played over in Ireland. Um, you, you know, you don't tear that up. So I get what Kevin's saying there. You know, if there's going to be no progression for that lad, what's the point of him being at Celtic? He may well should be the, the third choice. And then you bring, in, you bring in another goalie. I don't have any issue with the fact that we've given being a contract it makes no difference we can still offload them we can still sell them um, but if we move through the team and, and try and pull some of the positives because we've not even spoken about Maeda yet from the other 
the other day. Um, another big positive for me was the performance of uh, Leela Bada. Now, Abada's a guy, I've never seen anybody doubting his ability, Peter, certainly not an axon. Everybody knows what he's capable of. But there, all, there always seems to be that bit where we've not seen the best of him yet. We've seen loads of potential. We've seen some tremendous goals and assists. But on a consistent basis, I still think that there's a lot to come from Abada. Um, he seemed to play with a freedom the other night, well, the other morning for us. He played with a freedom and we we channeled it to him as often as we possibly could. You could see McGregor, Awata, Hatati, every time getting the ball, they're looking for Abada. I thought he was sensational. Um, and now, you know, the question I would ask is do you think the time is now for him to step out of the shadows of Jota and become that that game, that that game changer, that match winner himself? I think it could be the time. Um, you get a new manager, new impetus. Uh, the manager might prefer you more than Ange did. Um, when you, what's different about Abad is uh, he's finishing like you. You, he can be sort of like the days ago sometimes, but in big times of the season, he's come up with really, really important goals for us, and you can't really put a price on that. Like um, to to get somebody that's going to you know, get in at the back post and, and like, with the way he's done against Rangers and score these goals, like, that's that's worth its weight in gold sort of thing. And we are bad at, he's always run, he's always looking to run in behind, he's got pace, and I think that's what Rodgers is looking for. And that's why I fancy them to play, I did actually fancy them to play Maeda and look at Maeda possibly through the middle. And that's when I think we'd be weaker on the left-hand side. And if we could maybe fill in that, that gap with a, solid, strong left winger. Then you've got Abada, Kyogo, Maeda through the middle and uh, uh, maybe somebody on the left, uh, as well as some of the people we've brought in. But aye, Abada for me, um, there's no rush. It, I don't see why we'd want to, want to leave. We can offer him, we can offer him a really good stage and we can offer him uh, good big nights in Europe against really strong teams. So, um, I think if I was Rogers, I'd be really doing what I could to keep him, and I wouldn't want to lose a badder for any. Like I wouldn't want to put a number on it, but like quotes of ten million are, are too low for me. Like I think it needs to be fifteen to twenty minimum, and um, because we're in a strong position with a lot of these players, and we've got really good contracts with them, and I'm I'm sick of selling pe people for uh, under their value because we know that. I think um, it was um, when. You remember Kyogo? There was interest in Kyogo and the, the transfer fee. This is when uh, James was hosting the show for a couple of weeks, Peter. The transfer fee was at 16 million. Mm -hmm. And I was furiously typing in the comments section that day saying, We need to get over that. I, I totally agree with you, Peter. We need to get past, you know, mm -hmm. selling ourselves short when it comes to players. I've heard fees of like 12 million for a bada, 10 million for a bada. And you think, well, you know, when you look at the potential, the, the potential sell on, if he was to go to, English football, and he was to be signed and then sold from an English club to an English club, um, you know, taking into account, again, what Kevin says, the Bundesliga transfer of Jens and how that can escalate the price of a of a player because you don't really want to sell to one of your opponents. Um, you know, you're looking at that and you've been stung with that in the past. I, I think we've, you know, in the past we have undersold ourselves. I know that it's slightly different when it comes to Jota because of the market that uh, the Saudi teams are, are kind of operating in financially. But no, I totally agree with that. And um, going into this pre-season, I would look at the wings. We've lost Jota, who can play both wings, obviously. But on the right-hand side, you know, you've got Abada and you've got James Forrest. You've got Rocco Vata. Uh, but you've also got two of... I'm, I'm now claiming... Um, Kwon and Yang as our players by the way but you've got two of the new players who can also play on the right hand side Marco Tellio and Yang they can play on the right so I think we're well covered on the right hand side I do have some concerns so I'm going to come to you first Kevin on the left so Maeda showed us what he can do through the middle sensational great performance he's your first pick on the left hand side but behind him you know you've got Haksibanovic and Mikey Johnson and I think you've got right hand side covered left hand side not so much yeah, absolutely. Uh, I wouldn't even include Mikey Johnson in there because he'll spend most of the season on the treatment table and maybe not even Celtics. Um, it's, a, it's a big concern, actually, that area of the park now. Um, and probably going into the start of pre-season, it was, it was the reverse. It was the right-hand side that you were thinking was the one that would need to, need to strengthen because I think then we were thinking Abada will be the player that will leave if we're going to lose anyone up front. 
-hmm. and now it's completely flipped with Jota going. So yeah, that's a, there's an area of the park we need to film there. I've got, I don't know, a back of my mind thing. Could you move Bernabe forward and just take him, take all these defensive responsibilities out of his game because he's he's pretty crap defensively, and put him on the left wing because he's got he's got something about him going forward. At least that might be, you know, somewhere where he can redeem himself. But otherwise, I think we probably do need to look to bring in a left winger. Um, it's not Haksabanovic. I love him at pieces, but he's not a winger. Why he's do a, we love him? Number ten. Why, Why? do everybody loves Sakzabanovic? Oh. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out what it is he's done that because you know he gets his adulation. Sakzabanovic has got the cult thing about him that you can't quite put your finger on. Because I don't know why I love him so much, but I just do. What neck <laughs> tattoos and peroxide hair and stuff like that? Just it is it the song? Be, maybe. But <laughs> it, I don't know. I usually listen to games with sound off because I can't be bothered with the commentators, so I've never heard the song. Um. I don't know. I think it's his touch. It's the way he controls the ball. It's the way that he kind of carries himself in the pitch. You know how you just get some players that like a Berbatov? Oh, he was a cult player because of the way that he played the game. I think mm -hmm. that's what you've got with Haksabanovic. That and you just know deep down he's got it in him that he can be a game changer. But he's got to be in the middle. I was mentioned. Yeah. And, and yeah. Definitely do need to there. Yeah, it was mentioned the other day that, you know, if he's going to be a player, he needs to do it on the big stage. And there's an argument yeah. to suggest that, that that's not happened, you know. He looked good against Inverness in the, the cup when he came on, but, you know, you've got to take that um, that particular team and ask yourself the quality of that team as well. So, yeah, I, I'm, by the way, I'm just throwing that out there because I'm one of the guys that, that's been championing Hacks about it. Why do we love him so much? Um, it's an interesting situation where, where fans can take to a certain player, Lloyd, and then give somebody else a real hard time uh, who's probably played a hell of a lot more games and put in a lot more minutes and a lot more miles. But that's what happens in terms of football. What's your take on the winger situation? I agree. I think going into it, it was the right-hand side you expected to lose a badder. That's maybe where you thought we were going to strengthen. We brought two in. Uh, but we definitely need to strengthen on the left-hand side. I, I get what Kevin says. I used to think the same about Frimpong. I never saw him as a defender. Uh, you know, I would have written him off as a defender, but I just think going forward, he was sensational. By the way, I'm not comparing the two. I'm comparing the two situations that neither of the two of them could defend. Frimpong was very, very good going forward. So do you think left left wing has become a priority as well, Lloyd? Yeah, I do. It's kind of, once again, what Kevin's saying. Burnaby does look more like a winger as well, but then they're leaving the left-back area a bit weaker as well in that situation. So it kind of seems as if that whole left-hand side's got to be a lot more strengthened this summer than what it was before because originally we thought it was the right-hand side but really it's now the left. Mm -hmm. If Maeda gets injured but do you really want him playing on Wednesdays through the middle because he did do quite well to be honest. He was brilliant. He was absolutely superb and you're right that, that's the thing if you get one player injured I mean it's bad enough getting uh, Alistair Johnston injured you then get two players and you really are scrambling about players are, are playing kind of out of position you don't want that anywhere on the park you really don't um, but there's certain areas of that park where you're quite top heavy certain areas of midfield right wing you're top heavy in that respect but then one injury to Maeda and you're thinking right going into a Champions League game going into a Glasgow Derby because that, that is what we need to gauge it on would you be happy if Haxabanovic starts you know I'm not convinced. I've not seen it. I've not seen it on the big stage yet. I'm going to give you my list of players that I'm, I would um, shed from the team. And I want you to tell me your own. I know Kevin's been thinking about it as well. Do you agree, disagree? Who else would you uh, be looking to move on? Double Denim, you're back in. Watch the usual uh, No Rocky YouTube highlights video. Boy, looks solid. Very Chris Iyer. Oh, I loved Chris Iyer. Uh, like in physique, but looks quick, tall, and has good timing. Difficult to tell of an upgrade on what we have, though. Um, it always is difficult. And you just, you know, you're at that stage where you really need to trust the scouting team. William O'Toole is quietly confident uh, they're going to get the signings right. Recently, things have gone well in that area. They have, let's be honest. It's just been one or two here or there that haven't worked out. I said earlier I was going to bring up the Lincoln Red Imp. Sorry, everybody that's tuning in. But just as a comparison to where we were in the first competitive game, first time round, to where we're going to be going into the first competitive game against Ross County very soon at Celtic Park. Can anybody remember, without Googling it, what the name of the goal scorer was? 
Kev, Lloyd, Peter. Cariasco? Cassiaro. Cassiaro, because it was a bit like Cascarino. I wrong order. That's what I was thinking. Lee Cassiaro. Obviously, I've got it in front of me, Kev. I'm, I'm not um, <laughs> pretending that that was on the end of my tongue. Yeah, the beaters won now. As you'll remember, uh, we have tried to forget. What was the starting lineup? So we had Craig Gordon and goals. Right, here we go. This is where it gets interesting. Okay, so we had um, Effie Ambrose, uh, Kieran Tierney, Sadie Yanko, and Sviachenko. Right, there's your defence. There's your back five. Yeah. Okay, we had uh, we'll Beaton. I down after mentioning Yanko again. That was... <laughs> I know. Where is he now? <laughs> uh, we had Beaton, Rogic, Brown, and Christie. Um, and Griffiths and Dembele. So, right, picture the scene. We never covered that game, Peter. Picture the scene. You're going in against the part-timers of Gibraltar. That's your team. Are you confident going into that, do you think? Oh, I we should have run them up. I couldn't believe we, we get beaten that. You I mean, you get Dembele, Griffiths. I like Sv- Sviacheco as a player I really like. Um, I thought he won a lot of balls in the air and stuff. So, um, I I think that's a solid enough team apart from maybe maybe Yanko. And take him out of the equation. We're going to have to figure out where he is on the bench. Actually, uh, Nadir Chiefche wearing number seven. Deary me, Stuart Armstrong, Mikael Lustig, Paddy Roberts, um, Leo Fazan, Callum McGregor, and James Forrest. McGregor on the bench, interesting enough. Um, so when you compare that, it just shows you that that's a European qualifier. We seemed kind of ill-prepared for it, didn't we? You know, when you look at the, the lineup, the the stamp of Brendan Rodgers wasn't on that. It shows that the pre-season had been used, and even some of the competitive games uh, that came early back then, had been used for him to assess the squad before he starts putting things in place. Football fans, me included, you want everything done yesterday. But it seems as though we are, we really are approaching this quite patiently. Um, and I know that back in the day, that was so frustrating, especially with the European qualifiers. You wanted everything in place, uh, but not the best side in the world. And obviously we went in and we got beat 1-0. I remember Griffiths um, having a few chances in that game. It was one of the ones and Ambrose mistimed or misjudged the bounce of the ball, didn't he, for the goal. I've not checked where Sadie Yanko is on the football globe, but um, I will before the end of the show. Right, here we go. The 10 players that I would uh, cut from the squad based on the numbers that Brendan has given. He likes the core group to be 17, 25 is a long list. Right, I'd uh, move on Scott Bain, Liam Scales, Osazi Urugide, Stephen Welsh, Ismail Osoro, um, James McCarthy, Liam Shaw, who has been linked with Wigan this week, David Turnbull, might be controversial, Mikey Johnson and Albion Ayeti. I'm going to come to yourself first. Kevin McCluskey, agree, disagree, or add the names to that list? I'm agreeing with every single one of them because I don't think any of them have really got a, a, a long-term future at the club. Um, I'm going to have to remind myself of who you mentioned at the beginning, goalie-wise, because if you didn't mention both keepers, I would get rid of both. I went for Bain. Um so I'd I get for Ben Seacrest as well. I'd have them both there. Um, oh, I'm pretty sure I wrote down a list actually somewhere because I knew you were going to ask this question. You see, um, Idiguchi. I know they're out on loan, but guys like Idiguchi and Kenny, uh, Mikey Johnson. I think you might have mentioned him. Would all be there, and Kobayashi. But I'd I'd uh, I'd look to loan him out rather than sell him. Where would what type of environment you're looking at though? Uh, with Kobe, I think it's one of the ones where are we loaning him out because he's got a a few years on his deal and he's not going to play a part, or you're loaning him out with a view to bringing him back ready for the first team. The latter, mm-hmm. loan him out with a view to bring him back to the first team, because uh, I think Lloyd made a great point earlier on when he was talking about him that he looked he looked pretty decent in the first half. I thought when. Was it Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon? And a lot of that, I think, was to do with the fact he was back playing in Japan. He was in kind of surroundings that he was used to, and that's the level of opposition he's used to. Um, but he needs to toughen up for Scotland. I just don't think we can afford to have him toughen up in our first team. You know, we're not a learning curve for him. He needs to be ready. So I'd take him to somewhere like La Liga 2 in Spain, 
because I think it's a it's a good standard. It's European, so he's going to get used to playing against different type of opposition, and he's going to have to toughen up there as well because that's quite a physical, athletic league. Mm-hmm. I fully expected people to disagree with Turnbull, by the way, um, and I'll give you my reasons for it. But I'll ask I'll ask the rest of the guys on the bullet and first Lloyd. What's your take on on my last? I didn't think it was being brutal because I'm basing it on contribution. And I'm looking at the last couple of seasons and the contribution that virtually all of the, those players, except for Turnbull, actually, has been minimal. It's been negligible. You know, you look at McCarthy, I use him as an example. Uh, the, the lack of football that boy's played since he came to Celtic should be no surprise, actually, because that was the kind of level he had been playing at for a few seasons prior to signing for Celtic. He wasn't playing a lot of games for Crystal Palace and Everton five seasons before he came to Celtic. Lo and behold, he doesn't play many games for us. But it's all down to the contribution. And of that list, the player that's played the most games is undoubtedly Turnbull. So I fully expect people to disagree with that. What's your take on the list, Lloyd, and uh, on Turnbull? Because he's the one that a lot of people are disagreeing with. Yeah, I would take Turnbull out that one. And I would probably put Segrist in that. And obviously bring in a, a first-choice keeper. Um, obviously, get ready. And I got Jane, Johnny Kenny as well on that list because they're just not going mm. to contribute to this team. No, the, the thing, it's interesting with uh, Idiguchi, there was talk about um, his loan deal this morning as well. So again, it's one of the situations where you bring three players in, and I'll tell you what, if, if you could get two to three every time in a transfer market, you're doing well. You're doing better than Celtic have done at certain points in the past. Johnny Kenny, very, very low. Johnny, you know, low risk bringing him in from Sligo Rovers. Uh, it's not worked out for him. He, you know, a bit of homesickness there as well. We tried it in Scottish football by loaning him out to Queen's Park. You know, he didn't get a game. It turned out, you know, he was on the bench. He wasn't playing. You would expect him to go there and, and you know, score goals and make an impression. It didn't happen. He went back to Ireland. So, yeah, I do agree with that as well. And what about yourself, Peter? What, what's your take on it? I agree with the list. Um that you list only for the reason that there's some sort of controversial players on it, like Turnbull. But I think you need to look at what you can recoup for these players. So Turnbull, you're going to make some money on. Uh, well, not make money on, you're going to maybe recoup some money back. Blame skills, you might get money back. And again, we need to trim the squad. It's far too big with far too many people taking a wage and not contributing to the team. And if you can look to get 16, 17 really top quality players, then that's what we need to do. We need to trim this squad. It's too big. There's too many people we've forgotten about that are still on the books. And um, I think you look at Turnbull, for example, and you think, well, can we go out and get better than him? I think we could. So I'm looking at Europe. I think we need to really flex our muscles and, and... a lot of people think it's going to be a, like, a close title race. I think we've got the opportunity to really race away if we do this right in this in this transfer window. Uh, build a team that's strong enough for Europe and the league will take care of itself and another treble should be incoming. So um I I would I would I wouldn't disagree too much. I would I would um put in Seagrist, I think his head's gone, I think he's away in his mind. So get rid of him. I think maybe you need to keep Bain just because He's Scottish. He comes under that sort of like... That's the one thing we need to worry about is this homegrown player thing. Um, but for me, if Bain was staying, I would put um, Oliver Emi out on loan and I would bring, like the guys have said, uh, a challenger for Joe Hart. No, no a second uh, string goalkeeper, a challenger to come in. I think Joe Hart could do it again for another season. I think he has his good games and... But I think with what we've been exposed to with Barkas, anybody that saved a shot, we well, were just happy. So um, I, we need to really up the level and uh, the defence. Um, make us because we're already good at going forward. We can score a lot of goals, but we need if we shoot up the defence, we're going to be a really really hard team to stop. Mm-hmm. So that's no, you're right. And that point you made about winning another treble that that is vital. You imagine the situation this time next year if we have you know there's been a, a rebuild. Um, at Rangers, where would it leave them? So you're right, I'm, I'm at that uh, kind of point as well where I just want to push on. I don't want to you know, retreat in any way, shape or form. The DJ of choice brings up the homegrown rule. Yeah, I was interested to hear 
the way Brennan and Roger spoke about it, we are he was talking about backfilling it with young players. So you put in your squad for Europe. Um, and some of those guys could be even Toby, who I know we signed him from Spurs, but he has been in our youth system in Scotland for over three years, which means that he is, uh, you know, he is one of the homegrown players. Um, I'll tell you what, we should never be in a position where we're keeping the likes of Bain um, or or McCarthy, who basically don't play. Scott Bain has played 75 games of football in five years for Celtic. You know, you, you can't keep a player like that simply because you've got the homegrown rule. You know, I'd much rather an 18-year-old sat on that bench with no chance of getting on in the Champions League. The, the 10 players I mentioned, I don't know exactly what each of them are on, but you're talking 100 grand plus a week in wages. And other than, than Turnbull, none of them are contributing to this football club. Um, so, yeah, that is something that he's going to have to be uh, wary of as well, and I don't think we're being brutal. I think that these guys are not contrib contributing. You take that hundred grand, you know, you could bring in three quality players. You've got the money in the bank. You, you know, you redistribute the wages elsewhere. It's a very interesting discussion that we've had today, gents. A very quick one as well. And we never even got to Maeda and O'Reilly and some of the other really good performances. But we will be back tomorrow to cover the game. I was talking to Laura Bradburn. Actually, just before we started, so uh, Laura's going to be joining me for the game tomorrow. It'll be a, a welcome return of Laura Bradburn coming in, into the game, uh, the game time uh, coverage. Please remember, if you are enjoying what you've seen, you want to comment on it, you want to disagree with us and everybody else in the comment section, then subscribe to the channel. That's all you have to do. It's free of charge. Uh, give us a thumbs up on the video. And if you want to come along and see us live, then we're in Glasgow uh, next week. One week to go. And it's Axel with Roy Aiken. Feed the bear. Cannot wait to interview Big Roy about his Celtic career. So much to ask him. Um, and there are some tickets available. VIP is completely sold out. There are some tickets available. 15 quid. And the video link is underneath. The big thing as well with regards to um, our gigs is we you buy a ticket, you get a free raffle ticket. And the raffle prizes are brilliant. So um, we've given away like paintings signed by the, the guest, jerseys, footballs, all that kind of stuff. You're going to pick something up if you win that, uh, which is well worth it. Thank you, everybody, for getting involved. 900 strong in the live stream. Thank you to Lloyd, Peter and Kevin McCluskey for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Thanks, Tom. Cheers, Paul.